Hi, everybody, and welcome to our session on replatforming Victoria's Department of Health onto single digital presence. So today we're going to cover um, the things that you're seeing on your screen there. So we're going to look at some of our project requirements, the process, our solutions, and also the give backs to the SDP platform, um, and also some key project takeaways. First of all, a little bit about your presenters today. So first of all, we have Suchi. <laughs> Hi, my name is Suchi Gad. Uh, I'm a technical manager at Salsa Digital, and at the risk of exposing my real age, I've been working with Drupal. Uh, I've been working in, with, in open source technologies for the past 20 years, and I have been working with Drupal since 2006. Uh, so that's 12 plus years experience with Drupal. I have been a developer, a TL, a solutions architect, mentor, trainer, pretty much everything when it comes to Drupal. And in this particular project, my role was of a technical lead. Philippa. Thanks. So my name is Philippa Martin. Um, I'm a salsa content strategist and also a project manager. Uh, I've actually got 25 years plus experience, also exposing my age, um, in writing and editing fields. And uh, with definite online specialization, even since the very early days, um, I think I got my first role as official online content writer in 1999. Wow, I'm really exposed to my age now. Um, in another life, I'm also a published author with a PhD in creative writing. Uh, for this project, though, I wasn't working um, as, as a content specialist. I was actually working as a project manager. So first of all, let's have a little bit of a look at the project context. So the Department of Health um, is a very large Victorian government agency. Um, as part of their consolidation of lots of departmental websites, they've chosen to move um, health.vic.gov.au to Victoria's single digital presence. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I know some of you in the room know what SDP is because there are some people from the Victorian government here. Um, SDP is a whole of government uh, digital platform that consists of three elements. Uh, it has, the first one is called Bay and Bay is the platform itself. Then we have Tide, which is a headless Drupal distribution. Uh, and finally, we have Ripple, which is a front-end library of components, which is built in Vue and Next. Uh, in terms of some of the key challenges for this project, the website was on Sitecore. It had a high cost of ownership. It was actually a very large site. It had been built up over a number of years, like a lot of government sites, of course, um, more content coming in. Uh, and there was actually 80,000 content objects in total, and that covers pages, documents, um, and other components. There was also a lot of features and functionalities. And obviously, what, during a migration project, what often happened is both content and features are actually looked at in terms of what do we really need and what can we actually get rid of. Uh, the team ourselves, oops, go back. Uh, we're quite a large team. So from the um, Victorian Department of Health, we had eight members in total, a uh, project manager, product owner, a delivery lead, a designer, a developer, and we also had three content creators on the team as well. Um, in terms of the Salsa team, we had the engagement manager, which was myself. We had a, a business analyst, a solution architect, the technical lead, Suchi, um, a migration engineer, a back-end dev, um, and also two front-end devs, as well as an accessibility consultant who was involved throughout the process, and of course, QA. I'll pass to Suchi for some process. All right. So we basically went through a step-by-step -step process. Uh, we went through a series of discovery sessions. And Can you put the mic a bit closer? Sure. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So we went through a series of discovery sessions, and out of those discovery sessions, there were we were able to identify the required features for the new site. The next step was, okay, this is a feature that we want, but we had to map it both to the front end, which was a ripple, and to the back end, which is, which is tied in single digital presence, the SDP. After that, we were looking at the gaps because there were so many features which when there was no one-to-one -one mapping and we started discussing those features. Some of them we sort of changed a bit to make sure that they map with the existing features, but there were some which were absolutely needed and there was no feature within SDP which, which could map. So we went ahead and create some, created some custom features. Then we set up and built the site, including the custom features. 
We did them. So we did some migration. About seventeen thousand pages were migrated. Uh, seventeen thousand pages were identified that needed to come across, and they were migrated across. Of course, we had to have migrate media elements. So around about thirty thousand media elements had to be migrated. We also went ahead and set up some pages manually. So, for example, the home pages, some of the landing pages, etc. We had to tweak them a bit and uh, set them up manually, and then we launched. Very easy, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So now a little bit more about the process. So like all good projects, we started off with some discovery workshops. I probably need to make, move this microphone up as I'm just a little bit taller yeah. than Suji. Um, so we start off with some discovery workshops and we we're looking at documenting those as a feature matrix in Google Sheets. So I think you can just move here. Okay. And, all right, all right. Yeah, let's do that. Talk. So this is, this is actually the feature matrix that we created in Google Sheets. Uh, as you can see, we've got a legend here that um, looks at every single element, looks at it's got color coding for MVP, nice to have, phase two, aspirational, et cetera, and it breaks down each element. So for example, the original header had a site switcher, home link, top navigation, an extranet login, et cetera. We went through every single sort of feature and functionality um, in, from everything from footer uh, to header from top to bottom, literally, uh, and on it, all the different pages as well, and notated those. So just to give you an idea, though, I'm just going to scroll through. Hopefully I don't make you seasick as I'm scrolling through. You'll get an idea of how many different features there were because we ran out of letters of the alphabet. <laughs> and we kept going, started getting a bit creative with our symbols. Special characters. Yeah, special characters. Okay. Uh, so this is just a visual representation of that. Uh, from there, we then moved to mapping Ripple. So Ripple, of course, if you remember, was the front end component library. So we had to look at those different features and how they would map into Ripple. To do that, we used Figma. So this is an example of uh, a bit of a zoom out of the Figma file. As you can see, we've actually also kept our letter and number of references. So you've got your A1, A2, et cetera. We've used colour coding again. Um, in this case, the colour coding is representing whether it needed to be a custom feature or whether there was something already existing in SDP that we could use. To give you an idea of what's inside each of those boxes, because obviously it's hard to see, uh, this is a simple example of video. So on the old website, that's what it was called, the um, video uh, on, on the health website, the video feature. And on SDP, that mapped nicely to the embedded video feature. All right, back to me. So yes, we did a lot of discovery sessions. As an output of all the discovery sessions, we basically got a total of over 110 features, which were identified as MVP. MVP, minimum viable product, but 110 features were MVP. So those features were imported into Jira as Place, ticket placeholders. Now remember, for each of those features, we actually had to create three tickets per feature because we had to have a back-end ticket, we had to have a front-end slash Ripple ticket, and we had to have a migration ticket. So that's exactly what we did. So three types of tickets, front-end, back-end, and migration. That means 600 plus Jira tickets, stories, tasks, bugs, etc., etc. We also made sure that uh, we we did a lot. We created a lot of uh, manual test cases as well, and all of them also create, were also created in Jira. That means 1,000 plus manual test cases. So standard Azure, Azure process was followed, and with each sprint progressively, we would look at the most important tickets slash features, and we'll put them into the sprint, and that's the whole process that was followed essentially. That's again you. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, the accessibility we did. So I did mention that we had an accessibility consultant on the project from the start. So we brought that person in really, really early. So for example, they're part of the design ticket. So from the very start, as the designer was working, tickets would be passed on to our accessibility consultant to make sure that they were um, uh, okay in terms of accessibility for co colour contrast, et cetera. 
Uh, then they're also part of all the front-end JIRA tickets. So every front-end JIRA ticket included um, an accessibility um, uh, acceptance criteria. So here's an example. Uh, and you can see, you know, given I'm a website visitor, when I visit any page on the website, then the footer is WCAG 2.1 AA compliant by. I'd actually step out what um, those requirements meant from an accessibility point of view. So this embedding accessibility early in really helped with um, ensuring that the website, the final website was accessible. So now it's on to some of our solutions. Uh, so first off, uh, we had so talking about some of the custom features. Obviously, you know, like all good um, community contributors, we try and avoid custom where we can, uh, but there are times when we can't avoid custom features. And so here's a list of some of our custom features that we implemented for this website. Looking first at the home page, uh, we included health alerts, and I'm going to show you these in a moment. Uh, some customized news cards that the client wanted, and also we added in some social media cards, including pulling in the social media feed for their home page. So I just go to there. If we look at the home page here, so these are the health alerts. Oh, sorry. Uh, if we go to the home page here, these are the health alerts. Um, as you can see, you can click on this to, you, you've shown the latest one, the most recent one, but if you click on this, it expands to show back a little bit further. Uh, and you also have the ability to uh, browse all the health alerts. Scrolling down to the news pages. So these were um, just slightly different to the normal SDP out of the box um, news that they wanted some customizations on. And then we've also got the social media feed as well here coming in from Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. So those are the homepage customizations. Uh, if we look now at sidebar links, I'll hand over to Suchi. So yes, we keep on saying that we try to minimize customization, but we did a lot of customization. The next one we, we wanted to talk about was the sidebar links. So SDP by default does allow us to list out a component on the right hand side of the page where we can have links, but there was a slight there was there was a slight mismatch with the requirements. So what we did was we go, went ahead and created a new component which was called sidebar links. And as you can see in the um, in the screenshot there, the red outside, uh, the red outline structure, that's what it has. The way it was different with the standard ones was two things. Number one, we could embed a we can we could embed multiple sidebar links on the right hand side of a single page and we could change the background colors there were three specific colors that that a user could select so they could either have a gray background background they could either have the uh, a white background and the third option was the color palette of the of the site they are on so that was one um, customization and the second one was that with each and every link we could act, actually add a description as well because what I think we offered was just links, but what was needed was that with each link, there, there were some links where we needed to add in um, description. So as you can see in the first and the third link there, there are some descriptions that have been added. Another quite major customer, not I would not say major, but quite useful customization was by default, if you go to an SCP site, the top navigation menu, and the footer menu. So the menu that we hit, see here, the topics about us, et cetera, et cetera, they are actually fed, up, fed off of the same menu. That means the top one is replicated in the footer. But considering the fact that health.wix site is so huge, they wanted to offer the users a different way of navigating. So they wanted this, these links to be separated out from the top navigation. So what we did was we basically went ahead and created a new menu item, a, a new menu. And that menu was linked to the front end component here so that they could have different links showing up here as compared to showing up in the top navigation. Uh, the next custom feature that we'll look at is content collections. Um, so these are basically um, list pages. So you'd normally use views in Drupal. However, because single digital presence is headless and it uses elastic search to index data, we needed to look at a different solution. Um, from discussions, we also knew that SDP had some bigger plans for content collections. 
um, where they wanted to let content editors build these pages, which is again, views are done by site administrators. So to give you some of the examples, we had quite a lot of content collections. Um, we did some um, A to Z of infectious diseases, for example, annual reports, conviction register, video, audio. Uh, we had lists of data pages, lists of fact sheets, list pages for media releases and news. And in fact, because we were developing the content collection as a listing page from scratch, we ended up using that for the whole site search as well. So I'm going to show you some of these pages now. So this first one's the A to Z of infectious diseases. As you can see, there's also some front end theming in terms of adding in this um, literal ABC. Uh, and then we have the results are automatically displayed for all of the results. They can be sorted as for items per page. And in some of the other ones, for example, the videos, you also have the ability to search by keyword. We have other drop downs available as well. For example, file type is available in some of them. Again, this is another example of some of the front end theming with our little video icon. And then the main search, which is this one, so that de by default everything comes up. So, well, that's an very even number there. <laughs> I'm sure that'll be different tomorrow. Um, just for us, so exactly 10,000. Uh, so, yeah, you can enter by keyword or you can select the topic and then browse by topic. Again, with the ability to sort by relevance and also change the items per page. Uh, and so in this way, our content collections were actually built into the website from very tailored pages, listing pages to the whole site search. Go back to the presentation. That's me. Another thing, uh, another custom feature was that what health that we wanted what was that within the same website, they also wanted a way to slightly change the color palette. So, and that could be used for campaigns, et cetera. So I have put in a screenshot of three pages and all three have actually different subs. So, so SDP allows us to tag content with sub, something called uh, subsites, but as of now, SDP does not have an ability to actually color code them differently. But what we did was in health.wic that with each subsite that was created, we could actually add a different color palette. So if you look at the, these three websites, the health service partnership, that is the core health.wic palette that, that has been added. Then the medication for patients, there was a, there is a subset called COVID-19, and that has a slightly different uh, different part. And you can see that the H1, uh, the styling of H1 has changed, and the styling of the right hand side bar, the right hand side menu item has changed. And now recently they have added another color palette and another subset called Jobs in Victoria, and that has that orange palette. Unfortunately, that orange really clashes with pink, but yeah, that's <laughs> what they wanted. So. <laughs> So this is again a uh, customization we went ahead and did, did for them. What this helped them is, uh, with is that they did not have to do custom development in case they needed a campaign. They did not have to really go and create another site or create, you know, create another site and develop that from, uh, from scratch. They could use the existing website and they were easily able to maintain uh, campaigns. Now I'll also talk about two pretty big custom features. All of the ones that we have talked about as of now are very smallish. They had huge impact, yes, but dev-wise or um, effort-wise, they were not that huge. But I'll be talking about two. One is the symmetry search. Another one is water fluoridization. And I'll just do a quick demo as well. Um, First one, second, second one, yeah. All right, so Hell.Wig wanted, as the name suggests, search symmetries, yes, but the content for the symmetries does not reside in Drupal. They, all this content actually resides on data.wig, and what we had to do was that we had to create a front-end component which could talk to data.wig, get that content, and show it we could also search so i can do something like let me just put something or something terms of work so we could do something like this and say 
radius of 10 kilometers. It gave me a search result as a map. We could also see a listing at the bottom. So these are all the uh, symmetries around. And I could actually click and go to an individual symmetry page. Now, none of this content is actually inside in Drupal. All of this is coming from the uh, data week on the fly. So in order to achieve that, what we did was we create a, created a front end component in Vue.js with Nuxt as a layer, which did all, all the calling, all the, all the filtering, searching, et cetera, et cetera. And that Vue.js was actually embedded within Drupal. So for that, we created a very simple custom paragraph called um, custom, yeah. Uninspiringly, the name of the paragraph is custom component. <laughs> so we just went and created that. And what it did was it just asked for one key. And that key was basically something that was defined in the front end. So that would tell you, like, OK, I have to generate the custom component and use this key to figure out which custom component need to be added here. So we did that. And this is a pretty, pretty powerful and very uh, used one. In the, in the similar way, there is another one. It's my so that this data is called water fluoridization data. I think I'm correct. But uh, this data is also not residing in um, Drupal. It's also coming from APIs, and it has a similar kind of a thing. So is the is the is the water fluoridization fluoridated or not fluoridated? That's what it shows, and we can also again search and do several things with it. Okay, going back to the presentation. I don't want to close it. Yeah. Sorry, this is not my mouse. This is her Windows machine. So. <laughs> I convinced her to use my Windows instead of her Mac. Um, so yeah, those ones we were just talked about was the cemetery search and the water fluoridization. Yeah. Uh, we also added quite a few new custom content types. Uh, so some of them are here, so conviction records, data page, the health alert advisory, hospital circular, and a record page. Did you want to say anything more about those? No, they're pretty no. straightforward. Yes. And I will hand over to you for this one. So as we had been saying that we are good citizens, we mm -hmm. try to not we try to we were trying to restrict ourselves to the into the SDP boundaries as much as possible, but client requirements can't do much. So we did create a lot of custom components as we just saw. But the way the process was done that the SDP team who's actually sitting here, they were they were consulted right from the very beginning. So uh, we had involved them from the initial phases of the project, and we would have regular meetings with them where we would discuss the customizations. This meant that either the customizations, either it was decided that the customizations would be adopted slash adapted and would be added to SDP a screen later, or the co we coded things in a way. And Anthony, you can <laughs> you can say no whenever you want to, but that's what we try to do. And we also coded things in a way that the upgrade path was not impacted a lot. In fact, sorry, how do I get that? Yeah. So in fact, that ever since the site was launched, we've already upgraded Ripple. We have already upgraded Tide. So we tried to manage things in a way that it was not impacted. There was a minimal impact. All right. So next now start about migrations. So the next three slides actually can be an individual Drupal South presentation in itself. They are complex, but still, I'll rush through them. Happy for you to come to me later on. We can discuss them out, but that's what we have to do. So before we start explaining the migration, uh, explaining the process, we need to talk, talk about two main tools that we used in the whole uh, migration. The first one, Quant CDN or Quant as we call it, it's an all-in-one static web jam and Jamstack solution to generate a, and serve a static representation of your existing website. It is actually a bit more, but for the context, context of this project, we just used it to create a static representation of the legacy health.wix site. The other tool that we should talk about is Merlin. So Merlin is an open source command line tool. Uh, if I have to talk about it like short and sweet, it crawls and scripts. 
So it is basically a content migration helper tool that can be used to migrate content from any source content management system into any target. So basically what Merlin does is it crawls and scrapes your website and emits the content of the website into nice JSON files. And those JSON files can be easily then added, uh, used and absorbed by Drupal and my for migrations. Now, the next slide, please don't be afraid. Um, I'll be talking about the steps and then I'll be showing you a diagram. Okay, so as I said, yes, migrations are a huge part of the project and we migrated a lot of pages. It was not the number of the pages that was a problem. 17,000 pages, yeah, well, it's a bit huge, but not really. We, we have been part of projects where we migrate millions of pages. The problem was the source of the migrations, which was the legacy CMS. So it did not emit content in a structured manner, in a nice manner. And that was a big problem. So what did we do? We extracted a list of URLs for the content that needed to be migrated. That's number one. Then we used quant to take that list of URLs and create a static page, static a copy of the website because we did not want our scraping tool to be hitting the production website. We wanted the scraping tool to be hitting the static website instead. We analyzed and collected the, and organized the source content into format, formatted JSON files using Merlin. This is just one line, but it actually involves a lot more. Using Merlin, what we did was we mapped each and every field that we needed to extract. So H2, was, for example, H1 needs to be migrated as a title. H2 needs to be migrated as summary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And H1 and H2 are very, very basic things. But the moment we start going into accordions, a contactless component, a this component, that component, this thing started growing mammothly. So we created config files for those mappings, and then we ran it against Merlin CLI tool which gave us pretty nice structure JSON, which Drupal likes. Then we created migrate, migrate API configs with, with those JSON files as source and migrated them into Drupal. Now, during this whole process, because this was a huge website and because the content was that huge, we made sure that we implemented a layer of validation throughout the process. This is part one of the of the uh, the diagram, uh, and let me just quickly walk through. We don't have a lot of time, so I'll very, do, be very quick. So I, I've just we just mentioned the steps: export the URLs, create, and then the URLs were also not very well exported. We created a Drush script, which did a refinement of the uh, the input CSV. It gives us three outputs: refine CSV, Merlin URL list, and quant URL list. Quant URL list went into quant, we created a static site. Merlin URL list, we did the Merlin mapping, we did the Merlin scraping, it gave, gave us the JSONs, 404s, redirects, and duplicate content. We also created a refined CSV, which was used in the next step for validation, because refined CSV made, me, meant that we had a list of URLs that need to be, need to be migrated. So what we, we again created another Drush script for validation and the output of that that drush script was a very 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 important csv that csv had all the urls with their status was it migrated or or not was it a duplicate was the redirect created because in within this process we also um, uh, also baked in the redirect process if it was migrated what is the target one what is the source url what is the target url and that csv could be given to the client they had an excel file and then it made the qa for them very very easy because source target map it it didn't work create a jira ticket if it worked great so this was the whole process that we followed and philippa so as we mentioned um we were working closely with um, SDP on those custom features and we were able to give a lot of them back into the core. Um, so for example, our give backs included the custom footer component that Suchi mentioned where people are able to actually customize exactly what, how they want the footer to appear. 
uh, the content collections were actually taken over. What we had done were taken over by STP, who, who have been progressing them further to make them into those um, content editor experience. We had also some contact us enhancements, which were contributed back. The sidebar links that Suchi talked about were contributed back. Um, and also that embed our um, innovatively named custom component uh, was also delivered back. So that was also used, for example, for those social media cards. Um, we just did the in the back and the embed custom component. Uh, and also the news content type was also contributed back. Um, these givebacks were sponsored by Celsius. So um, after the project finished, we um, then worked on well, after the site went live, um, and so the main part of the project was finished, we did hand over then to support. Um, but the givebacks were sponsored by Celsa, and so we continued to um, get those and distribute them back to um, SDP, working then with the SDP QA team. Uh, key project takeaways very quickly. Um, in large projects, um, it's, it can be difficult to allow enough time upfront to write and review and estimate all tickets before the build starts. Um, building accessibility into the acceptance criteria earlier worked really well. As we've said, we had it from the design and also all the front end tickets rather than doing it as an afterthought once a website was built and then having to change things and fix things. Um, a strong product owner on the client side is essential. I think everyone, all the devs in this room and project managers will be going yes. Uh, we also had the benefit of a dedicated um, and highly professional project manager. So um, he was able to work uh, extensively on the project and really dedicate a lot of his time to managing the health team and working with us as well. And that's it. Um, Question. With the content migrations, uh, what sort of percentage of the whole project was that? And was that a, a new methodology that you introduced? So the methodology that we introduced was absolutely new. This was the first time we introduced this methodology and that has now been, actually, we've actually had four projects after this one where we had followed the same or similar, you know, slide with slight tweaks. Uh, when you talk about the percentage, um, so the initial, so the leg, the the old website, it was, it was, it had grown organically. So if you look at, so what, uh, what the help thought we team gave us was, a huge CSV and with like a number of columns and then they said we have some business logic apply that business logic and then migrate so that is why the first step was that we had a drush script which was do, which was which did the refinement and those business logic was apply, actually applied in to get the output so when it comes to percentage I would not be able to answer that because there was so much content there it was somewhere it was maybe published but it was duplicated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's very, it's very diff difficult to give me, give the percentage. I've got a second part to my question. Sure. So part of that process was there a content lift process going on, and how did you handle that, or was it just a one for one straight migration of content? There was no content lift involved. Uh, there was a one to one migration, mm -hmm. and as all the content was extracted from the old site using the Merlin scraping, so we did not use the content in the in the old database and try to do a lift. No. Okay. Two quick questions. What search engine do you, did you use? Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch. And with the content collections in the views where people could see, are they used or no. mechanisms no. used to present that? And that is the best part about content collections actually. So that gives the the ability to create pages like this, content creators can create those pages. It doesn't have to be a site builder purpose. So we are not using views. The con in the on the back end, so back end and front end are two different things in SDP because it's a decoupled thing. In the back end, we have a, a component called content uh, content collections, and within that, we can easily add filters. So filter can be a topic or this or that, you know, content type, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as a content creator, you can say, for example, I need to create a news listing page. So you can actually go and say, let me create a content collection. The filter will be that the type should be, the content type should be news. And I need to show that as a list, not as a tile thing, as an example. Then I will expose the date as a filter. So you could, do, as a content creator, you can do this and it automatically map up into a content collection page on the report team. Okay. So that's how strong it is. Thank you. I'll just add to that to um, clarify that 
Um, we had done step one of that process, yes. but step two was done by the SDP team to take it to that level. Um, so we had done it using schemas that were put straight into the back end. Um, and then the SDP team took that and created the user interface for the content editors to make it the final process. Cool, SDP team. Thank you. You have a question here? Yes? Uh, yeah, with that many pages, uh, what did you do with sort of internal and external broken links? Yeah, so the question is with that many pages, how did we manage the internal and external links? A few things actually. So the migration configs that we created, and I'm going into a bit of a technical thing here. For external links, we didn't have to do a, do a lot, right? But whenever we are migrating, so each content type, con each source content type, let's put it like that, we had two migrators to it. The first one would be the base migrator, and then we would have an annotate migrator. The way it worked was, first, all the base migrators run. That means we already have stubs, etc. Then the annotate will run. It will look at the links, try to map, okay, this is, because we were also, whenever we were migrating, we were also saving in the Drupal three things, the source URL, the, uh, the source URL, the source type, etc., etc. three things. So it will look at, okay, this is the uh, alias, this is the old alias, let me look at the migrated content and see what maps it to, what is the new alias for it, and that annotate actually changed that. And this was done for media as well. So yes, it was complex, but that's how we managed it. We also migrated, we also created a huge list of redirects. So these were the two ways we managed. 